want to introduce you to Demers today. I've been thinking a lot lately about life, the universe and everything. I wondered if there's more to life than what we can see, if there's anyone or anything beyond us. I was curious about faith, spirituality, religion, whatever you like to call it. Living in Athens at that time, I, Damaris, had plenty of options. There was a smorgasbord of spiritualities claiming to connect us to the divine. Jews who lived among us Greeks had their own ideas. Worshipping in the synagogue, they also attracted followers drawn to worshipping only one God and to Jewish values and behaviour, God-fearers they were called. Most people worshipped a multitude of gods. Our city had a pantheon, a pantheon of gods to choose from, depending on what you needed to manage life. So when our soldiers were at war, the statue of Mars, the god of war, had flowers and food and other gifts piled up all around it as people prayed for victory. If your husband was setting sail, you'd try to keep Poseidon, the god of the sea, on your side. If you needed more money, you'd go and worship the god of wealth. If you wanted a child, you'd take offerings to the goddess of fertility. Gods for every need to have a good life, to have control. But sometimes I wondered if these gods, these powers were actually in control, demanding devotion. If you want to manage your life, you need me. You need more money. You need power. You need sex. So worship me. What terrible troubles have flipped our world from devotion to such gods. Our city was full of idols. In fact, someone once said, it's easier to find an idol in Athens than a man. We even had an altar to an unknown god to hedge our bets just in case. The story goes that a plague once ravaged the city. People didn't know which god to appease to stop the plague so they built the altar to an unknown god. But who knows? Our philosophers had other ideas about life. Maybe you've heard of the Epicureans. They believed that the gods were a long way away. They weren't interested in human beings and didn't want anything from us. So it's best just to relax and enjoy yourself and not worry about anything. The Stoics, on the other hand, believed that the divine was close within the world. Divine power resided in trees and rivers and mountains, in everything and in every person. So you needed to find divinity within yourself. You were the one in control of your life, so be true to yourself and live in harmony with the divine force within you. So many different beliefs and ways to live. Obviously, they're not all the same as some people sometimes think. But how can you know what's true? How can you know? Well, something happened one day to help me in thinking about these things. It was someone, actually, a visitor to Athens the most unlikely and unprepossessing person. He looked as though he'd been beaten up. Bruised and limping he was. I later learned that because of what he'd been teaching publicly, he'd been flogged and imprisoned in Philippi before being released without charge. Then he'd travelled down to Thessalonica and was where he was driven out. Then he went to Berea and before any more trouble befell him, his friends put him on a ship and sailed him, he sailed down to Athens. Apparently, on arrival, he'd spoken in the synagogue. Yes, he was Jewish. Then people saw him in the marketplace, talking to whoever would listen, including some of our philosophers. 
It was really hard to know what he was on about. Some strange new teaching. Something about Jesus and Anastasis. A foreign god and goddess. Didn't we have enough gods already? Well, it seems some people wanted to know more. Athenians loved nothing more than telling or hearing something new. So they took him to the Areopagus, the hill across from the Acropolis with its magnificent Parthenon dedicated to the goddess Athena. That's where the leading men and some women of Athens would meet to decide important matters. It used to be the place of the courts. And that's when I heard that what this man, Paul, had to say. He'd obviously wandered around the city, looking carefully at all our shrines and altars and idols. I heard later that he'd been quite disturbed by them. Anyway, he began by mentioning that altar I told you about earlier, dedicated to the unknown God. I was shocked when he boldly said, I'm going to tell you about the God you worship as unknown, the God you don't yet know. I wondered how he could know. Basically, Paul told us three things about his God. Of course, he talked for much longer than the few minutes it takes to read the summary our brother Luke recorded. First, he told us about a God who is above and beyond us, who has given us life and breath and everything. God you don't know, he said, is Lord of heaven and earth. Wow, that's big. We had to submit to Caesar as Lord, and God, actually. He ruled the empire, large as it was, but small in comparison with the whole universe. What's more, Paul said, God made the world and everything in it, all its beauty and abundance. He is over and above it. You can't fit him into a box, let alone into one of the shrines our craftsmen have made. I'd always wondered about worshipping idols. Why bother with them if there really was such a great God? We are all here, Paul went on, because God gave us life and breath and everything. From one ancestor, he said, God made all the different nations to inhabit the whole earth, and it was God who decided on how long and where they would live. We are totally dependent on the God who created us, the life and breath and everything. God is not dependent on us. He doesn't need anything we can make or bring. All those offerings, all that time and money and energy given to idols, all swept onto the rubbish heap. We don't need to give to idols. God has given everything to us. This is the God you need to know, said Paul. Rather than worshipping the unknown, you can know the God who gave you life, the universe and everything. Secondly, and surprisingly, Paul told us, God wants us to know him. God created people, all the people in the world, for a purpose, so that they would search for God and perhaps grow for him and find him. It made me think of games we play as children. You're blindfolded and you grope about in the dark trying to find people. Or hide and seek where you run away and hide and wait patiently to be found. So God made us to search for him, to grope around for him, and God wants us to find him. Then Paul added, in fact, God is not far from each one of us. Well, that's the opposite of the Epicurean idea that the gods are far away and not interested in us at all. God Paul wanted us to know is close to us. You know, I've sometimes been aware, sometimes at a difficult point in my life, 
of someone being close to me, a presence holding me, loving me. Maybe it was this God. Then surprisingly, Paul quoted two lines from our own poets. He was obviously well educated. For in him we live and move and have our being. That was the first. And then, for we too are his offspring. So we don't have divine life in, within us. We can't find God in ourselves, as the Stoic philosophers taught. We live and move and exist in the God, the very source of our life. We've come from God, but we're not God. We're totally dependent on God for our life. More than that, we're God's offspring, like God in some way. Offspring tend to resemble their parents. I'm the spitting image of my mother, you know. Well, Paul moved on to the obvious conclusion. Since we're God's offspring, he said, we shouldn't think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human art and imagination. It made sense to me. How could God, who made everything, be represented by an image? Except, of course, a human one. Where did that leave everything we've known till then? All our gods, the best of our philosophy. Idols, Epicureanism, Stoicism. Dead ends for knowing God. The God who made us and sustains us, who's given us life and breath and everything. And the God who wants to be known, who wants to be found. He wants us to know him, the God who cares about us who is as near as our breath. I've never heard anything like this before. It resonated with me in some of the things I've been thinking about. But how can we know that it is true? Paul was leading to this, his third point. Something has happened. God always wanted people to find him and know him. Remember the game of hide and seek? Sometimes children get tired waiting to be found. So they come out from hiding and show themselves. Of course, God has not been hiding, but now something has happened. God has shown himself more clearly than ever before. So the time for not knowing God, for being ignorant of God, is now over. God has overlooked the times of ignorance, said Paul, and now he commands all people everywhere to repent. It's now time to turn away from false trails and turn to the true and living God. That's what repent means, of course, turning away and going in a different direction. So what exactly has happened, I wondered. Why now? Because, Paul said, God has fixed a day on which you will have the world judged in righteousness. God who made the world and everyone and everything in it has now done something about all the problems in the world and in us. God has now done something to sort it out. Something's already happened to change the world forever. And one day, a day already fixed, the whole world will be sorted out forever. Everything that's wrong with the world and within us will be set right. God will have the world judged in righteousness. I've seen plenty of things that aren't right, unrighteousness if you like, in my life and people getting away with it. I know a poor widow in a village outside the city. She had one cow eking out a living by selling milk, butter and cottage cheese. One day a powerful man in the village stole her cow and refused to give it back. She couldn't do anything about it and she longed for justice. Eventually a circuit judge came to the village. He decided in favour of the woman. 
ordered the thief to return her cow and to pay her compensation. He was thrown out of the village and ordered never to return. The widow and everyone who'd been afraid of this man were delighted. That's what they'd been waiting for. It was good news for them, but bad news for the thief when the judge set things right. I thought Paul, carefully about Paul's words. God has fixed a day on which you'll have the world judged in righteousness. Bring it on, I thought. How we need an end to injustice, wars, corruption, violence, famine, sickness, death itself. How we need a God to set the world right. Our gods, our idols, were just like us, quarrelling, fighting, killing. What if there really was a God to put an end to such things? But how could we know? I waited with bated breath as Paul explained. God has fixed a day on which you will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Raising a man from death. So that's what Paul was on about all the time. Good news about Jesus and Anastasis. Of course, Anastasis means resurrection. I've heard rumours coming from the east about a man called Jesus who'd been crucified and came back to life. If God really did raise him from the dead, then we needed to turn to the God who will one day sort everything out, even our worst enemy, death. Well, Paul's words about resurrection from the dead set the cat among the pigeons. Hadn't the playwright Aeschylus written, when once a man has died, and the dust has soaked up his blood, there is no resurrection. So some scoffed. I heard some in the crowd say, what a lot of rubbish, impossible. Others in the crowd said they wanted to hear more. But Paul left without further ado. And I was deeply moved by all Paul said. Something was stirred within me as I listened to him. So I, Damaris, joined Paul and became a believer, along with others, including Dionysius, one of the leading men of Athens. I had so much to learn, of course, and this was only the beginning of my new life as a follower of Jesus. Some stories about Jesus were circulating. I loved hearing them, and I learned so much more. Copies of letters from Paul to believers in other cities reached us too, and they helped me to learn more about living as a follower of Jesus. And others joined us, a whole community together following Jesus. It wasn't always easy, of course, but something changed within me. It seems that God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, gave me the strength I needed to live for him day by day until the time when I was welcomed into his presence. How wonderful that I heard Paul that day on the Areopagus and came to know the truth about life, the universe and everything. I turned from idols to worship and serve the true and living God, the creator of all, who is close to us, and to wait for the day when Jesus, alive from the dead, will set the whole world right. I hope this is true for you too. Thanks for listening to my story. Let's pray. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen.